This episode, and others like it, are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support this channel, and get early access to every video, plus our patrons-only Discord server, consider becoming a patron by following the link below. On September 18th, Hurricane Fiona made landfall in Puerto Rico. At the time of writing, at least 20 people are confirmed to have died in the storm, and millions were left without power or clean drinking water, the services for which have yet to be fully restored. Ten days after Fiona, on September 28th, Hurricane Ian made landfall in Florida. Again, at the time of writing, over 130 people have died, and millions have been displaced or have lost power. With current estimates, Hurricane Ian has already become one of the deadliest storms to hit the mainland US in the 21st century, second only to Hurricane Katrina. In terms of structural damages, financial estimates hover around $50 billion for Florida and $3 billion for Puerto Rico. For millions of people, not just in Puerto Rico and Florida, but in every place these storms have struck, their names have become synonymous with tremendous loss, fear, and destruction. There are no statistics I can give you that will ever fully capture the extent of that suffering. For a handful of capitalists, however, these hurricanes mean something else entirely. In the wake of the crisis, a scramble for profits has begun. This week, we're looking at disaster capitalism. For decades, hurricanes and other extreme weather events have been called natural disasters. The number of severe natural disasters of the natural disasters of weather-related disasters latest extreme weather disaster And, yeah, on the face of it, of course that's what you'd call a hurricane. Nobody pushed a tornado button. There's no earthquake machine. Nor can you simply will a tsunami into existence. Of course, you can summon a blizzard on demand, but that's the exception. Minus the ice cream, these events are obviously produced by non-human forces. They are, quote-unquote, natural. But it's obviously more complicated than that. While extreme weather events like hurricanes are not triggered by some guy somewhere, the role of man-made things in the way these events play out is far from negligible. Natural disasters are not naturally disastrous. And one man-made thing in particular, capitalism, has a lot of influence on whether these events actually become destructive, and to what extent. A hurricane, on its own, does not have to be a disastrous event. For example, if it passes over an empty patch of sea, or a community with robust protection systems in place. It is only when a hurricane has horrible consequences, something within the scope of human influence, that it becomes a disaster. In this video, we're going to try to understand that idea. Specifically, we're looking at how the imperatives of capitalist economic growth have prepared for, dealt with, and responded to extreme weather events. Or, more accurately, how capitalism has made these events deadlier before they even began, utterly failed their victims once they've happened, and exploited these tragedies for the purposes of wealth accumulation towards the top of society. In short, we're looking at how capitalism takes an extreme weather event and makes it a disaster. First, we can start with the ways capitalism prepares, quote-unquote, a natural disaster. And the obvious place to look is climate change. Hurricanes are made worse by climate change, and climate change is made worse by capitalism. To quote an article in Time magazine, The science is well known. Higher average temperatures lead to warmer ocean waters, which in turn causes more evaporation. As hurricanes pass over, they absorb more moisture, leading to heavier rainfall. Warmer waters linked to climate change also increase the storm's wind speed, and can cause hurricanes to undergo so-called rapid intensification more often. Rising sea levels also multiply the flooding danger from what is often the deadliest aspect of a hurricane, storm surge, helping to push flooding further inland. TLDR, things associated with climate change, like warmer waters and higher sea levels, lead to more intense hurricanes. Just to be clear, this hypothesis is pretty widely the consensus among climate scientists, and is supported by mountains of evidence. But that's just the first half of our equation. Then there's the fact that capitalism intensifies climate change. While it was the Industrial Revolution and its shift to fossil fuels as an energy store that produced the sudden increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it is capitalism that has multiplied and entrenched the continued emission of these gases, despite overwhelming evidence that we should be moving in the complete opposite direction. We know we're in a bad spot, but capitalism prevents us from moving forward. As just one example, we have proof that fossil fuel companies kept secret and then actively misinformed the public about climate change and its consequences for decades in order to remain profitable. 
They knew about global climate change long before most other people did, and made sure it wouldn't get out so they could keep making money. And it's not like that sort of stuff has stopped. Today, the lobbying efforts and raw economic power of fossil fuel groups actively prevent degrowth policies and a general transition to renewable energies from gaining political ground. Because of this, climate change causing pollution has remained profitable. Despite our certainty that a reduction in emissions and pollution of all kinds is necessary to keep our planet hospitable for our species and millions of others, capitalists invest tremendous resources into preventing this change from happening in a fair way, if not preventing it from happening at all. Capitalism produces hierarchies of power, and that power entrenches these hierarchies. So what's good for fossil fuel profiteers trumps what's good for the rest of us. But this is a very macro example. We also have evidence of how the capitalist profit motive has the same effects at a more local scale. And for that, we can turn to another American hurricane, Katrina. What made Hurricane Katrina the deadliest mainland hurricane in the 21st century was not its intensity. When it reached New Orleans, Katrina had already gone from a Category 5 hurricane down to a quote, tropical storm. Still an intense and extreme weather event to be sure, but a measurably weaker one than other hurricanes in the past, and a designation that, on its own, does not explain the tragic spot Katrina occupies at the top of the list. No, what explains the deadliness of Katrina is what happened before the storm even formed. The destruction of the wetlands and the willing neglect of the levees. Both of which were done in total disregard for the poor and disenfranchised, and in the explicit interests of profits. First, the wetlands. In hurricane-prone regions, wetlands have the benefit of slowing down storms, dissipating a bit of the energy, and leading to less damage further inland. In short, wetlands act like a kind of natural buffer, a first line of defense against powerful storms. But natural buffers don't bring in that sweet, sweet cash when they're just laying there doing nothing. For decades, therefore, these wetlands were systematically destroyed by profit-seeking governments. Specifically, the destruction of the wetlands in Louisiana was fueled by the construction of the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, a channel constructed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to expedite shipping in the region. The problem is that in favoring profitable construction over the preservation of a necessary ecosystem, the Corps of Engineers actively led to the destruction of the wetlands at a rate of one football field-sized area every hour. But that's not all. The canal they built made things even worse by effectively serving as a funnel, bringing Hurricane Katrina more quickly to New Orleans, and ultimately making the storm worse in two ways at the same time. Unsurprisingly, a very similar thing has happened elsewhere in the US too. Like in Florida, where real estate development companies successfully lobbied the government for decades for the right to build in flooding susceptible areas. To no one's surprise, this profit-motivated building frenzy endangered thousands of people when these places did flood years later during Hurricane Irma. But back to Katrina, because we haven't discussed the levees yet. Around 80% of New Orleans flooded during Katrina, largely because the levees broke. For years, as early as 1998, environmentalists and activists had been alerting the government of the weakness of the levees, with concerns that a strong enough storm could cause ruptures and flood significant parts of the city. But these weaknesses never got fixed. Not because it wasn't necessary, but because two things got in the way. One, neoliberal, i.e. capitalist, governments are committed above all else to cutting costs on services that benefit the poor in any way. For neoliberal governments, giving money to businesses is always on the table. After all, Amazon deserves not to pay any taxes ever. But the budget is always too tight for public school supplies. Public services, however necessary their function may be, don't bring in money and increase deficits. Something that isn't necessarily a bad thing on its own, but which liberal governments pretend is the end-all be-all of politics. The budgets always need to be balanced, and the things that get in the way of rugged capitalism are always the first to go. Two, engineers were making more money in the fossil fuel sector than by repairing levees, this was a problem because the Army Corps of Engineers, an institution with an explicitly public function, was heavily reliant on private subcontractors to actually do its job, after reforms had essentially privatized the US ACE from the inside. The oil industry offered big profits thanks to the Iraq War, so these subcontractors that the Corps depended on just went where the money was. The more necessary work, fixing the levees, was abandoned for the more profitable work, 
Tragically, as a consequence of these two capitalist influences, the neglect of the levees led them to break in over 50 different locations during Hurricane Katrina, displacing hundreds of thousands of people and flooding most of the city. And now we get to how capitalist systems fail during the immediate period of disaster relief. Here, several things come into focus, and reveal another aspect of disasters under capitalism. Their unequal effects on the disenfranchised. In New Orleans, like almost everywhere else in the US, that disproportionately means black people and the working class. While many of the city's wealthy had the ability to leave ahead of Katrina, many people without the means to leave and in flood-prone, poorer neighborhoods were forced to stay and suffer the brunt of a neglected and neglectful system. For one thing, it took five full days for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, to get food and water to the people seeking shelter in the New Orleans Superdome. Five days without the provision of the most basic human necessities in a disaster. In the face of dire need and a complete lack of alternatives, people did the natural thing and took food from local stores, only to be depicted as looters in national media like Fox News. Unsurprisingly, this kind of framing and attention created a surge in white supremacist energy, leading police officers and, quote, gangs of armed white vigilantes to shoot these so-called looters on sight. Plenty of evidence from the time shows how, emboldened by the chaos, white supremacists seized the opportunity to shoot black Americans with impunity and racist motivations. But it doesn't stop there. In addition, private security company Blackwater was hired by the federal government, with some of its guards being deputized and given permission to use lethal force. And similarly, other private security companies were hired by New Orleans wealthy elite to guard their expensive estates. Finally, on multiple occasions, the National Guard itself was used to direct New Orleans residents from one location to another without giving them any information on where they were going, pointing guns at them, and, in some instances, separating children from their parents. Only a highly militarized, racial capitalist society could have produced this outcome. But if this horrifying level of violence wasn't enough, other aspects of the hurricane relief effort were doomed right from the start. That's because a lot of the aid for Katrina provided by FEMA was purposely funneled through for-profit companies, which, in the words of one author, worked about as well as you would expect. Quote, the idea that residents will be helped by a company that does financially profitable business is in the neoliberal imagination a win-win scenario. But what win-win language conceals is the ways in which there are actually losers in this arrangement. In order to show profits to stockholders, companies like ICF must orchestrate a type of bureaucratic failure in order to allow profits to stay within the company long enough to raise quarterly and year-end fiscal calculations, rather than being distributed downward to recipients who bring essentially no profit to the company. Elsewhere in her book, Adam says, These businesses were allowed to work with little regulatory oversight. In the end, they were able to profit from human tragedy, turning sorrows into opportunities for capital investment. And fraud watchers calculated that by 2009, ICF had used some $6.4 billion in order to distribute only $1.5 billion in actual relief awards to recipients. Finally, all this was accompanied by the refusal of insurance companies to cover flood damages in the wake of Katrina a decision that was backed up by the American justice system and meant that many residents with insurance never got the money to rebuild. Not to mention the fact that many people couldn't afford insurance in the first place, because this kind of poverty and an extreme interpretation of personal responsibility are natural features of the capitalist system. But now we get to perhaps the most insidious part of these quote-unquote natural disasters. What happens next? It is not enough that capitalist incentives undermine our systems of protection, give more energy to the storms that hit our shores, leave vulnerable hundreds of thousands of people during a crisis, actively endanger those people further, subject them to militaristic violence, or create profiteers from disasters. No, extreme weather events are also used to deepen the capitalist system and entrench it further, to make all these effects worse for the next time and consolidate the power and wealth of the capitalist class. Disaster capitalism means using disasters to push through even more capitalist politics. For Katrina, this capitalist entrenchment is best exemplified in a list by the Republican Study Committee titled Pro-Free Market Ideas for Responding to Hurricane Katrina and High Gas Prices. In this list were a set of policies given to George Bush that included, quote, 
recommendations to suspend the obligation for federal contractors to pay a living wage, make the entire affected area a free enterprise zone, and repeal or waive restrictive environmental regulations. With the exception of the living wage recommendation, Bush implemented most of the RSC's policies. Most notably, the post-Katrina capitalist shock therapy resulted in the privatization of New Orleans' public school system, which locals had been able to resist for years, but were ultimately subjected to in the midst of the chaos, making the New Orleans school system the most privatized in the country today. But Katrina isn't the only example of disaster capitalism working this way. Following Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, the story was the same. Riding on the wave of the hurricane, the government's public electricity company, PREPA, was turned over to the private American-Canadian company, LUMA. As we all know, of course, only good things come from privatizing a natural monopoly. But that's not all. The government of Puerto Rico also took advantage of the storm to pass a series of austerity measures and business-friendly tax laws, increasing investments in the tourism industry in Puerto Rico, which has unsurprisingly increased rents and pushed many residents out. What starts to appear in all these examples is a terrifying feedback loop. Capitalist developments of the past make us more vulnerable to disasters. They make these events more destructive in the way they play out. And they're followed by the deepening of the capitalist system that reproduces the cycle anew. For capitalist and capitalist governments, then, extreme weather events are not tragedies to be avoided and protected against, but in a deeply disturbing way, they actually become opportunities that pay great dividends. If that sounds jarring and cruel, don't take it from me. Those are Condoleezza Rice's own words. First of all, I, I do agree that the tsunami was a wonderful uh, opportunity to show <clears throat> not just the U.S. government, but the heart of the American people, and I think it has paid, paid great dividends for us. Um, I'll leave you with this. For people in Florida and Puerto Rico, the details of what comes next are still hazy. Already, we have seen every Florida House Republican voting against disaster relief funding. Speculators predict that real estate prices will go up in Florida, further gentrifying the affected areas. And we saw a goddamn postcard company tell its workers that work was more important than evacuating. Things are looking bad, and the full scale of disaster capitalism is still unfolding. Not just in Puerto Rico and Florida, but everywhere else. It is clear that this is not a sustainable system, and that we can't afford to continue down capitalism's destructive path. But the good thing is that we don't have to. As much as these events enable the deepening of the capitalist system, they can also become critical moments of radicalization and collective action. In all the disasters I've mentioned in this video, genuine human solidarity has shown through time and time again. Networks of mutual aid have stepped in where our elected officials haven't. People have organized their available resources and skills as a community under extremely limiting circumstances to best satisfy people's needs. And all of this, crucially, without seeking profits in the process. Every disaster, every crime of the capitalist system, brings us one step closer to saying enough is enough, we're trying something else. Sooner or later, we will build a critical mass of class-conscious average people, united in our desire for a better world beyond capitalism. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. As I've expressed many times before, YouTube doesn't treat socialist creators very well. Because of this, I rely on viewers like you to maintain my channel. If you like the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. We have everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, to special channels for our neurodivergent and LGBT comrades. I also try to do a live Q&A once a month, which is always a good time. We've built a great little community, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. So if you'd like to help support my channel, join the Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.